Okay, so let's go to tonight, just an area in Psalms here. I thought we'd just go through. I know we talked about the weapons of our warfare, and we talked about the helmet of salvation on Sunday morning. Uh, a couple other things there we talked about, too, about money and uh, money being uh, love of money being the root of all evil, uh, the message that gain is godliness, and a couple things. Uh, so this, this night, let's just go to Psalm 112, and we'll just go through this a little bit. I think it's an edifying part of Scripture. There's a lot of good things here. Part of 12, part of 113, and even a sp spot there in 114 uh, and 115. I mean, if you go start reading through this, it just sort of all fits in together as all the Psalms kind of do to one sense or another. So Psalm 112, it says, Praise ye the Lord, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. And so the idea that we've come to know the Lord and understand his blessings and uh, the commandments and how they protect us actually and keep us from evil and from sin, he's saying we're blessed in all this. So praise the Lord, all of us, and blessed is the man that fears the Lord, which of course we know is reverences the Lord. At one time we were afraid of him in the sense of what fear means, but to reverence him because we now know that his love and mercy, his grace, his protection, his favor is on us, uh, and, and we're in great position, uh, being right with God, cleansed of our sins. So we delight greatly in his commandments. And even the things that he's spoken are actually considered his commandments, although here, of course, we're talking about the Ten Commandments, the law of God. But it says, that man, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. And the gener generation of the upright shall be blessed. And I know that could be for all of our sons and daughters and our lineages and so on, should the Lord tarry, uh, that could look to them like a place of the enemy would love to attack. Because we're saying, well, look, our seed, our children, our heritage, our lineage, they're going to be mighty on the earth. And so the enemy would like to stop all that, of course. And so what do we see? People get involved in things and they get caught up in this and situations arise and then suddenly they're over here or over there and they're drifting away from the things of God. And as we preach and teach and minister to everybody, you know, that's why we've got to keep ourselves in the things of the Lord uh, because the enemy would love to do that and would love to make the promise of God look like it's not going to come to pass. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Upright means living a godly lifestyle, following through with all the word of what the promises dictate and what the commandments require and keeping a clean slate in the eyes of the Lord. You know, walking in forgiveness that Christ has given us at the cross repenting uh, quickly of sin. And you know, when we, uh, we talked about the young group there for a minute in Galatians 6, 1 there, that uh, you know, we're always mindful when we're gonna go talk to somebody else or maybe show them the error of their ways. It says that we've gotta be very careful because we may come under the same temptation. And so there's no place for real arrogance and haughtiness. And, the sad thing is a lot of times people uh, will see uh, maybe a little bit of an authority or a little bit of a, a, a pressing and they take that as arrogance or, you know, you think you can never sin or you think you could never fall. Uh, and I've tried to maintain, I know many of you can say the same thing, uh, maintain an attitude of, listen, I'm not going to come down on you too hard because... Same thing could turn around and come back to me. I know that. I could brag about, and I 
one point in time, I thought, gee, I hope people aren't bra thinking I'm bragging about certain things. And then a little while later, I looked and they were totally different than what I was thinking anyway. So we're not in control of any of that. We need to pray. We need to seek the Lord. We need to stay humble before God and know that it's him that brings all these things about. So his, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth and the generation of the upright. And you know, in the Proverbs there, and I've read this many, many times, Proverbs 30, it talks about the generation of the upright. And so we're talking about a, a, a group of people, just like we would say the nation of God, but the generation of the upright is a group or a season or a time of people to where they're really going to serve the Lord and walk right according to what he says. And they'll be as leaders and, uh, you know, people will look up to them, godly people. And uh, we're seeing a lot of that now for people who speak the truth in any manner. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. Now, doggone it, I just got done saying Sunday morning about money being the root of all evil and the love of money and about, you know, um, gain is godliness. And now we got to read in here that wealth and riches will be in his house. <laughs> so what's it really telling us, though? We don't have to strive for any of that. God will take care of us who serve him. Wealth and riches. And to you, riches, like I could say, you know, I, I look at people that make money and I say, gosh, I never made that kind of money. But you know what? I don't also have the headaches and a lot of things. And I've been fine and we've been fine. And some of you have been fine, though. I mean, you made a living. You got maybe savings and maybe some investment thing or whatever. But you never were in those realms. But you've made it till now. And you've learned how to live life. And you've learned how to, you know, maybe do things a little more modestly and humbly and uh, wisely uh, because you've looked at what you had and said this is how I'm going to stay or how I'm going to function in what I have I'm not chasing after this and chasing after that so wealth and riches shall be in his house and his righteousness endureth forever you know if we didn't have any wealth and any riches if we just barely squeak through life but we maintain righteousness Cleanness in the eyes of God, right standing with the Lord, isn't that worth it all? You know, you go to bed at night, you can sleep and rest, you wake up in the morning, you're not uh, overwhelmed with negative things, although we see a lot of negative things out here in the world. So wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever unto the upright, those are the ones that are the righteous and the ones that love his commandments, delight in his commandments. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. And we may be walking now in some of the areas of darkness in the earth because of the season of time we've come into where it seems to say that because the devil knows the time is short there's a raging and so we may be looking at the darkness out here but where we are it's light i know we talk about the land of goshen there was darkness everywhere but in goshen there was light well in every one of us even though there's darkness out here and darkness in people in all of us we're to be in the light we're to be walking in the light of the lord so unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious, the upright is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. And so you think about how many of us live, how we care about people, how we reach out with things or we get involved in things. And that's why I say even uh, with voting and things now, you've got to pay attention to the fact of what's going on in school systems and what 
things are being passed that will affect your grandchildren or great-grandchildren to where you've got to take a moral stance in all of these things. Now, if we were in a country that had a king and a parliament or whatever where the people had no representation and you didn't have any say-so whatsoever, different story. But you're here in America and we've been given the right to vote and to make godly choices as best as we can according to Bible principles to say these people are standing up for a more moral platform than these people, so that's who I'm voting for this time. And next time, if it comes out that those people have a more moral platform, then I'm going to vote for them. I'm not voting for party and people because I like them and they're just so funny and so nice or they're so rude or whatever. No, you don't vote for that. You're not looking for a marriage partner or a pastor in the church, even if they're rude and crude, but they're doing what's best for the country. That's what we're to vote for. What moral issues are being stood for in all of this and what ones are being just sort of trashed and thrown to the side. So, under the upright there arises light in the midst of darkness. He is gracious. He's got composure. He can control his emotions. Uh, he doesn't respond to every negative thing thrown at him or accusations and so on. He's full of compassion. <clears throat> Somebody thinks, you know what, the guy's got every right in the world to crush that dude. And he goes over and helps the dude and picks him up and cleans him up and says, here, you know, let me bless you. When he had every right in the world to go totally the opposite. He's gracious. He's full of compassion and righteous. He tries to maintain, look, if I did it for this one, and, and I do this with my grandkids because my mother used to say it to me all the time, and I've kind of kept it, but it is a biblical thing. I say, if I give you a $50 bill for your birthday, I'm giving everybody a $50 bill for their birthday. Nobody's going to get better. It's not like you're better or they're better, and I like you a lot, but I don't like you any more than them. Uh, you know, you go through that uh, type of thing. And if you talk to me more. Uh, so he's gracious, he's full of compassion and righteous. And then you try to be the same way with everybody. You know, you hear things about people. I've always tried, and maybe many of you too. If you treat me that way, I might begin to say, I guess what they said about you is true. But if not, and I don't see you treating other people that way, I heard this about you, but you know what? I'm not going to bother saying anything. We'll watch your life. If that's how you are, then we'll know that it's true. And if it's not what we see, oh, well, somebody just didn't like you. You know, you might have snubbed them one day or made them, you know, feel bad about something or whatever, and you go on. A good man shows favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. And so in everything we do, we're to be in our affairs, again, politics around us and things that you're looking at, uh, issues with schools and uh, neighborhood associations, things that go on in the community, all those type of things, crime on the streets, guide your affairs with discretion. Uh, watch what you say, pay attention to what you're thinking, and be mindful of always what's going on around you, but show favor and lend, you know, help people. Uh, be, be there like a, a willing, you know, if I can assist you somehow, or if I can show you the way out of where you're at, or if I can help you a little bit with your uh, problem emotionally right now, I'm here for you. And again, we, you know, we've always been taught that, right? I mean, people have so many ideas about what goes on in church, and it's like, and I mean lots of churches, uh, it's what you're taught all the time, right? Of course you're taught that, yeah, you're people of God, and people out there aren't people of God, and uh, some are of, you know, this father, and some are of that father, and there's proper things God has established and people trying to change those things. 
uh, I'm working on a little uh, ministry thing for some of these young people. In, in fact, gosh, I got it right here, part of it with me. Um, how many of you know what a, a mule is? Right? You know what a mule is. Now, I don't mean the ones that carry drugs. <laughs> or the ones they said during the election they were ballot mules. I don't mean that. I mean real mules. Mm -hmm. So they take a donkey, right, and a horse, and they made them together, and it's got to be certain, certain, uh, a certain setup. And in all the time that they've been doing that, there's only been 300 times that they believe that the mule actually was able to get pregnant because it's not a natural thing. Mm -hmm. They take a male and a female and made them together in this to get the mule so that the mule is stronger, it's more horse size. I mean, it's got the strength of the donkey, but it's horse size so it can go longer and, and better and so on. Anyway, 300 times in all the time they've been doing this that they can ever account, and that's worldwide, not just here in the States worldwide that a mule ever got pregnant. So because it's not normal, right? It's something that was fabricated, that was put together, that man did, and so it doesn't naturally work the way everything else works. Male and female, reproduction and so on uh, in all of the animal kingdom. And then there's the, uh, is it a cockapoo? Uh, a cockapoo, which is two dogs bred together, and you got a curly-looking uh, cocker spaniel, uh, yeah, poodle. right? Poodle, right? And so the the mix and everything. I, I didn't research whether they get pregnant like that or not. I don't know, but uh, because they're they're actually the same kind. Now the mule and the horse or the donkey and the horse, I don't know exactly how they look at that. I know they're probably under the same kind also. But so you look at these things in the earth and the Bible tells us Paul said something about things that even nature teaches us. And then you think when God said when men look at creation and see the beauty of creation and the things that are in order, they will understand there's a God. But yet they try to counter that with everything they can. And so you look out here and you see this kind together and this kind together and reproduction and mating and everything else. And you look at all this and say, you know, God put all this in order. Otherwise, everything could mix with anything and, and go on and whatever the case. So in all that, when we look at what the scripture says, guide your affairs with discretion. That word discretion means godly discretion. In other words, knowing what God has established, what God has in order, so that we don't go outside of any of that. He shall not be moved, in verse 6. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. So now I'm hoping I'm righteous and you don't forget me after I go. Surely he shall not be moved forever. And so, you know, I know another part of the Psalms, it says, my heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And so he's saying you won't be moved. Although we don't want to become so arrogant in a sense that we say I could never be moved and I could never be changed and I'll never take my eyes off of Jesus and some of the things over 50 years for me and maybe somewhere around there for some of you the things I've heard people say and I look for them in fact I don't see them in any of the chairs tonight <laughs> they're not around anymore but they had this bold steadfast Never this, never that, always this, always that. And I'm saying, Lord, keep me. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Mm -hmm. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Have you heard any evil tidings lately? 
just about every night you turn the news on, every time you look on these YouTube videos and some of these things, there's all this stuff somebody's trying to do, they're trying to accomplish that, they're going to bring that to pass, they're going to bring this to end, uh, you're going to have this and not that anymore, and here's how you're going to be living and where you're going to be moving and all this stuff. He says that we are not moved and we are not to be afraid of evil tidings. And in that, whatever the Lord allows, he'll bring us through. Now, that doesn't mean that we'll be glory, glory all the way through. You know, and uh, you think about some of the things we know about with the Holocaust of the Jewish people and uh, then some of the Christian believers who were there helping and working with them and other people in other countries and nations that were being uh, attacked for their belief in the gospel and things and yet they suffered a lot of loss but they lived and they continued in the Lord. They kept their righteousness, as it said here. And uh, they weren't afraid of the evil tidings. They still loved Jesus. And they still, you know, serve God. And they exude his love when you hear him talk. So he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And there's another place that says that too. But uh, his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And so if your heart was broken, um, your heart can be fixed. Although I know it means steadfast and stationary in the Lord. But if we've had broken hearts over issues and things, the Bible tells us very clearly when Jesus came, it was to heal the brokenhearted in Luke chapter 4. His heart is established. So his heart is fixed. His heart is established, which means it is either leaning on the Lord or it is fixed with a strong support. Established. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid. So we're not afraid of evil tidings. Our heart is uh, fixed. Our heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. That word desire uh, is also used down here about the wicked. It has a totally different meaning, but our desire is God's desire. That they would come to the knowledge of the truth and salvation as he desires. So his heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire uh, upon his enemy. He is dispersed. He hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever. So if you or I have not been given to the needy out there, the poor, and uh, maybe to groups who disperse to the poor and things, uh, sort of like our alms on top of our tithing and our offering, and then there's alms, uh, we need to up that. So he's dispersed, he has given to the poor his righteousness endures forever his horn shall be exalted with honor in other words um, the anointing we talk about we talk about the horn being uh, sort of our I uh, can't think of the word all of a sudden but sort of our promotion in a sense of what the Lord is doing in us not us promoting ourselves his horn shall be exalted with honor the wicked shall see it. In other words, they're going to see that the Lord honors our prayers. The Lord covers us. The Lord blesses us. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. And I think you can remember maybe sometimes this, but I have said so many times and prayed so many times that Lord, when they look at us, they will say there's no way they could have done that. It's got to be their God. And that's glory to God. It's not cunning. It's not wisdom of ours. It's not, you know, we pulled this off or any of that type or look what we did. All glory to God. He is the one. And so they, wherever they be out there, can see that they're not smart enough. They're not wise enough. They're not powerful enough. God has got to be with them. 
And I think a long time ago, a fellow who I knew from back in the other days, and he was a detective on the police department, and he said to me, uh, yeah, I hear this and I hear that, but he said, you know, my grandmother always told me, if God is with them, you'll never bring them down. And you know, he said, I don't see any of that happening, so God's got to be with you. Hey, and that's exactly it, the wicked, and I don't believe he was wicked, I believe he was a believer, maybe not in the extent of what we know, but the wicked shall see it and be grieved. In other words, it's going to bother them. Why didn't it happen? Why did it, Why do they just keep going on? It's like they keep growing, they keep prospering. And they will gnash with their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And that desire means they're lusting or they're longing after, you know, they're longing after to see Christianity wiped out or people brought down and God says it won't happen the desire of the wicked shall perish so jump over to 113 uh, and in verse 4 it just tells us that the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens this is our God who is like unto the Lord our God who dwells on high nobody um, Verse 7 says, he raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill. In other words, he takes people that nobody expected. We know that's in, in the scripture in the New Testament. And he causes them to confound the wise. So he takes the poor up out of the dust, the needy he lifts up from the dunghill. Uh, he sets them around princes and even with the princes of his people, which means folks that are in the nation of God, the kingdom of God, uh, he puts them right up there with them, even though he brought them up from nowhere. And then it says in verse 9, he makes the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. And you think about what God has done, what we read, and a couple of them are here. Maybe I'll let, let me read a couple more here. Down in 114, it says about the sea in verse 3. It says, the sea saw it and fled. What's he talking about? The Red Sea saw what it says in verse 1 and 2 about Israel and Judah. Uh, Israel being his dominion, Judah being his sanctuary. When they were in Egypt and he was calling them out. And it says the sea, the Red Sea, saw and fled. That's why it parted. Because it knew that God had set Israel and Judah. And then it goes on to say uh, in verse 5, The sea thou, or that thou fleddest. What aileth thee, O sea, that thou fleddest? And then that thou wast driven back. Talking about the Jordan. Remember when they crossed the Jordan River, the water stopped. And they crossed over and God told them, set memorials of stone here to remind your children what I've done for you. So he says, um, what aileth thee, O thou sea? That's the Red Sea that thou fleddest. Thou Jordan, that thou was driven back. The waters, the running waters were driven back. And then in verse 8 it says about God who turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters. And I don't know if you've ever, maybe we showed the picture of what they believe is the rock uh, to where it's probably as high as our ceiling here, or maybe a little bit higher, and then there's a big cleft down the middle of it where they say the water gushed out, and they said for the millions of people that were traveling there, did we show this, or have you seen it? I'll have to bring it up and, and show it to you. So they showed the ground ahead of there, and it said that they found rocks that were pushed way down as though the water flooded out of there and moved everything that was there. 
and then suddenly there's a pool of water that the people could drink of. So, um, yeah, I'll, we'll work on getting that. So, which turned the rock into a standing water, a standing water, and the flint into fountain of waters. And then down in 115, I just thought I'd read this. Because you know this is what's going on. Uh, they said, not unto us in 1 and 2 and 3. Not unto us, O Lord. Not unto us. In other words, Lord, that they'll know that they weren't smart enough to pull this off. Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the ungodly say, where is now their God? But our God, and times will be, I'm sure during some of the persecution of the saints and various things, people said, well, where's their God now? Uh, as Pilate said to Jesus about truth, hey, what is truth? Where's your God? Where's your kingdom? All these things. Wherefore should the heathen say, the ungodly say, where is now thy, their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. And aren't you glad that he pleased to bring you and I to Christ? To let us know the knowledge, have the knowledge of the truth and find forgiveness. Let the cross, the blood, the resurrection all have effect in our lives to where now we're who we are today compared to who we were then and that we are blessed of the Lord. So when they say, where's your God? Don't worry. My God's in heaven. He does whatever he wants to do. And I trust in that. Pray that you trust in it too. And you should fear that because you don't want to be on the wrong side of God in the end. And I don't want you to be either. Amen? So I'm going to just stop right there. And hey, anybody out there listening, thanks for being with us. Hope you get ministered to in some of this. And if you're one of those who's saying, where is their God? Just know that our God has done what he said he's going to do. He's going to bring to pass everything he said he's going to bring to pass. We have a hope of the resurrection of Christ in the end. And that's what we live for. And you can have that very same hope and the joy and the peace and the love that we have working in us can be in you and you can wake up one morning and find you're no longer angry at the world or family members or people around you uh, or the system out here that we know is doing a lot of corrupt things. God is greater than all of that Amen. and he'll do a great work in your life. Amen.